Welcome to One and One. I am Cyril Stover. On the 6th of June 2018, the Buhari government made a historic pronouncement which took many Nigerians by surprise. June 12 was proclaimed as Nigeria's New Democracy Day, replacing May 29, the day the military returned the country to democratic governance. Now, the history of June 12 goes back to the early 90s, 1993, precisely when the then military administration of General Ibrahim Babangida annulled the results of an election that was generally perceived as the most credible and fairest of all in the nation's history, an election that produced Chief Moshud Kashimawu Olawali Abiola as the undeclared winner of the presidential race. The ensuing crisis from that annulment pushed the country to the precipice and a near division along ethnic lines. Twenty-six years after, the first celebration of June 12 as National Democracy Day has come to pass. My guest today is a major part of the June 12 story. He has a rich background in diverse areas, a media practitioner, diplomat, technocrat, politician. He has all of these under his belt. But more significantly to today's program, he was the running mate to the late MQ Abiola, acclaimed winner of the June 12, 1993 presidential election. Let's welcome Ambassador Babagana Kingibe. Ambassador, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Interesting. Were you surprised a year ago when suddenly there was some recognition for June 12? It was declared as Democracy Day. In a way, yes, I was surprised. More by the timing of it mm -hmm. than that it happened. Um, I was actually on the Lesser Hajj in Saudi Arabia when the announcement was made. Um, I was not surprised that it was made because um, I knew that President Buhari uh, felt strongly about June 12th. Um, in the aftermath of the annulment, um, one of the architects um, of the annulment, um, former President Obasanjo, uh, tried to get elder statesmen, former presidents, and so on, uh, at his, I think, Africa Leadership uh, Forum or something he has, some organization, um, to see how the, after, the problems arising from the aftermath of the annulment could be addressed. And I think President Buhari did attend that meeting once, the inaugural meeting. And uh, I understood that when he saw the direction um, of the meeting, he decided not to attend again. And um, every time the issue of the annulment came up over the years, his position was very clear, it was very firm that uh, the elections were free, they were fair, and there was a clear winner, and um, that the annulment was unjustified. So having had the opportunity, perhaps, to right the wrong, so to speak, um, I wasn't surprised that he did so, because um, it is in his character to try and uh, do justice, however belated, um, and under whatever circumstances. Well, Ambassador, there are so many versions of what actually happened and what didn't happen. Some people claim to have been champions of June 12. Others were accused of not being champions. 
your position as the vice presidential candidate who was uh, billed to become the vice president of Nigeria was seen as key to what was termed then the June 12th struggle. But it took just a little time before some said you abandoned the cause. Did you really abandon the cause? Um, you know, June 12th was the creation of all Nigerians. Um, I really think it would not be fair to history and to the millions of Nigerians who participated in the political process, very unique political process that culminated on June 12th. Um, all Nigerians were architects of June 12th. Like all endeavors, uh, collective endeavor, there is always a leader. And um, one can never diminish the role of Chief Abiola in the final stages of this long political journey to democracy, um, in giving the leadership, in being the arrowhead and the symbol of that struggle for democracy. Um, I think we are now going to celebrate the first um, of June 12th being a democracy day. We are celebrating. It's an opportunity to recall all the positive takeaways of the June 12th experience, um, what it represented, and um, how we can learn lessons for the future. I do not think it's an occasion for recrimination, um, who betrayed who, who abandoned what. Um, you know, the whole process leading up to June 12th was a unique experience in the Nigerian political journey uh, towards democracy. The fact of June 12th, the elections that took place on that date were unique. We had many elections before that, but the elections of June 12th were unique. Um, the annulment of the election was unique in the life of, um, of all of us Nigerians. Um, and being unique and novel, I think everybody um, reacted um, according to their understanding of what, was, what reaction was required. I do not think that uh, we'll have the time to go through who played what role, who did what uh, on this occasion. All I'll say, as I said, is let's celebrate the event of June 12th and let's celebrate as Nigerians, let's imbibe whatever lessons everybody imbibes and we move on. Well, would that be the reason why all these years you've never been known, if I'm correct, to have spoken out specifically about June 12, the issues around it, and what? No, indeed, I never. Uh, this is the first time that I'm addressing the issue. Um, I, I was sometimes bemused. Um, I was saddened. Um, perhaps sometimes I was not surprised at all the comments that people were making about June 12, the claims to authorship of June 12th, those who stood on June 12th, and so on. Uh, I know every detail of what happened. And um, there is no way that one could tell the truth about June 12th um, without perhaps diminishing some people's roles. Um, without taking away from the significance and the solemnity of that date. And um, I just, I have actually recorded my recollections.
mm -hmm. um, of those days and those events. And um, I hope that uh, I'll have the opportunity to add my recordings one day. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it's on video recording, not uh, audio recording. Um, but I, I suffice it to say that, um, no, there are many ways of pursuing a goal. Um, to me, the immediate goal was to make sure that the annulment did not stand. That I had a very strong feeling about. And uh, don't forget, from the annulment to um, the enthronement of the interim national government, that was 80 some, 84 days or so, 82. And those, during those days, we all worked together to make sure that the ING, as the international government was called, um, it did not stand. Mm -hmm. And it did not stand. Mm -hmm. Thereafter, then we all had um, re our reflections collectively and individually as to the way forward. Okay. And um, we moved on. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. I do recall that after that, you went on to become Foreign Affairs Minister yeah. under the Abacha government. But let's go back to what you call the um, uh, positive takeaways from mm -hmm. the whole saga of June 12. And uh, many Nigerians like to think that uh, it was unique in a way that for the very first time, you had a Muslim, Muslim ticket for the presidency, and that did not in any way affect the voting pattern. Indeed. And this is really one of the regrettable um, uh, phenomena to observe, for example, today. In many ways, religion, you know, has now taken center stage as one of our major front lines uh, in our political actions. Let me go back. You know, June 12th was the culmination, as I say, of our political process, the so-called the transition progress of a process of um, uh, uh, President Babangida. Mm. He created the two party systems, the National Republican Convention and the Social Democratic Party. Um, and in fact, not only did, did he create them, but he gave them um, their constitutions and uh, their manifestos. What um, was referred to then as a little to the right and, and a little, little to, to the, the left. left. Now, I, I should say that in the SDP in particular, but to some extent in the NRC too, we try to make something out of that contraption. Um, in the SDP, we try to give ideological content to what is called a little to the left. Um, the NRC also did. And we worked on the basis of a vision for society. Um, what kind of society we wanted to see, uh, what kind of governance on a democratic basis. And this exercise was not restricted just to the active politicians, the leadership of parties and so on, all Nigerians, you know, had the ideas of how we should be governed, how the economy should be organized, how society should be um, run. Now, uh, in these debates that went on, there was no question of religion or tribe or region involved at all. In fact, um, it was a most thoroughly edifying um, process to participate in. Um, it was enjoyable. We all were addressing the issues, not the people, not the persons. And uh, those of us who worked together, worked as a band of brothers and sisters. We enjoyed each other's companies, we enjoyed the debates, and we enjoyed the challenges. Um, it's, <laughs> I, I recall with nostalgia that we would be on the campaigns or hustings, and we would be on television, radio, whatever, um, arguing against the ideas of the other party. And 
often in the evenings, Chief Tom Mikimi, who was my opposite number of the National Republican Convention and I, would get in touch. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we would invite each other for dinner. Sometimes we would just go out, sit down, have tea, and discuss broad national issues without it. Now, this is something that I miss. Right. This is something that I find lacking. And the most potent and dangerous is this religious divide, which a few, a few zealots um, who had no idea, no personal experience of where we are coming from, who now find themselves at the pulpits of the churches or the mosques, who are heating up the policy, who have brought up this emotive issue of religion, of tribe, northerner, southerner, Fulani, non-Fulani, Yoruba, whatever. These were issues that were of no relevance in the political process that led up to June 12th. All right. And it's a pity that uh, we have not learned that lesson. So were you pained uh, when it became obvious at some point in time before, uh, during the struggle for the actualization of June 12th that certain people, certain Nigerians, and some of them highly placed, began to introduce an ethnic coloration into the struggle. Did that bother you? Um, was it some Nigerians? I think by the time the regime of uh, President Babangida annulled the elections and they saw the reaction, then obviously they had to find some kind of uh, counter-response. And um, part of their strategy was to isolate the struggle for June 12th and the outcry against the annulment um, as a tribal thing, that it is the Yorubas um, who are the agitators. The rest of Nigerians, it didn't concern them. Of course, that was rubbish. Um, unfortunately, uh, they, were in, they were successful in um, hiring enough spokesmen in the East and in the North to perpetuate the myth that June 12th was a Yoruba affair. Um, I, I, I guess it's a, a strategy which under the circumstances they could use, but it was false and it didn't hold. Um, it wasn't Nigerian people who introduced ethnicity. It was uh, the regime of uh, Babangida in trying to justify the action that introduced the ethnic uh, perspective to the June 12th struggle. But then, so many years after, uh, the government of uh, President Buhari decided to make June 12th Nigeria's Democracy Day, honor some of the key actors who were involved in this struggle. And some said, but it stopped short, just that short, of saying, indeed, Abiola was the president of Nigeria, and uh, you were the vice president. And so, Till date, it still said that uh, yes, it was the best election, it was annulled, but uh, people are thinking, couldn't the government go the whole hog and say that was the president and this was the vice president? Declaration. Proof is, uh, is one way of looking at it, but then, and then so what? Um, I think it was very courageous and uh, uh, good of him to actually recognize June 12th for what it was. The rest is detail. To say Chief M.K. Abiola was the winner. Um, and then what happens? Um, you can't bring him back from the dead. He had sacrificed his life for the struggle. And so many years after, um, we lost it. What then follows? We have had several elections since then. Um, you know, some things you don't have to articulate. You, It's clear that by that recognition, uh, it's implied mm -hmm. that Chief M.K. Abiola won the elections. It is implied. Um, 
if he didn't win, what would be the point of recognizing June 12th as Democracy Day? Um, that is the little technical matter of the results were not officially, conclusively announced. Um, is a small point. We all had the results. It was the option A4. The results were announced at every polling unit. Everybody knew the result. But if one wants to be technical, the, 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 nobody had the power to announce the result except the National Electoral Commission of Amrin Wosu. And he didn't complete the process. Right. Is an argument. But I think short of actually saying so, um, President, Baba, uh, President Buhari did uh, uh, acknowledge um, and he did apologize to the family of MKO Abiola and he did apologize to Nigerians for the travesty that was done in annulling the elections. Um, I think some things are best said loud without saying anything at all verbally. Mm. Yeah. Well, the SDP and the NRC were the two parties then, and of course you started off first as chairman of mm. the SDP, uh, and later became uh, the running mate to Chief Abiola. Of course, the elections were held with those parties, they were also annulled. But there are people who say today, perhaps it's best to have a two-party system, and uh, if that experiment had been allowed to flourish, today we would have uh, something akin to a standard two-party system uh, as against where you have over 90 political parties mm -hmm. with the last election, 70 plus contesting for the presidency. What do you think about that? No, no, I think um, the two-party system worked well. Um, I wish that the system was allowed to mature. Um, President Babangida could have, after annulling the actual presidential elections, um, it wasn't Babangida, it was General Labacha, could have allowed the parties um, to survive. Mm -hmm. And they could continue trying to see if they can reorganize fresh elections or whatever. But if they kept the party system going, we would have matured um, to a level like um, you have in America where although they do have the garage parties and mushroom mm, parties, right. but you have essentially two um, political parties. Um, but of course, that couldn't be done. It wasn't the intention of Abacha to hold elections or whatever. So um, the parties had to be sacrificed. But eventually, even now, Gradually, the policy is gravitating towards two major political parties. I hope this process could be con consolidated. And it is within that framework that we will have greater unity of purpose. Um, it is within that uh, framework that perhaps some of our fault lines can be diminished, uh, whether it's religion or tribe or region or whatever. I hope that um, the zoning. Um, practice, which both parties do and which is assumed to be the normal thing, but it is not really, a, it has no legal basis. Um, I hope that it will eventually be jettisoned because we need to get to a place in Nigeria where we look for who is best to deliver, not where he comes from. Um, we will get there, uh, but we need to nurture the evolution of what will inevitably end up as two major political parties. Right, Ambassador King, we just uh, uh, one or two <coughs> issues before we, we round off. Mm. One of them has to do with the process of elections, the other has to do with whoever, you know, superintends over the elections, in this case, the Independent National Electoral Commission. And uh, when we talk of the process, option A4 uh, and the, uh, your time, mm. people look at it and say, yes, it's uh, something that produced leaders without all what we see now. But others say, no, but that's a cake. It's pedestrian. 
to in this day and age to have people line up in front of uh, photographs of their candidates i mean it's 2019 they say you think it makes sense to do to adopt an option like that given the state of violence ballot box snatching all kinds of things we see you know we have to ask the question what is the purpose of elections elections are meant to throw up the people, the candidates that the people want to lead them. Um, we want that to be done transparently. We want this to be done freely. And what is, then the next question is, so what is the best way of ensuring that in a complicated and complex uh, country like Nigeria. People have been talking about electronic voting and so on. Even the countries that have invented the electronic voting, they do not use it for their own elections. Um, so there are many, many methods used for elections. And in some countries, they take weeks for elections to become, in India, they've just recently finished their election. It took weeks. So really there is no, no particular merit in any particular form um, of throwing up who the people want as their leaders. It is what will work for any given society. In Nigeria, I believe the option A for is the best option and it has nothing to do with um, being primitive or not as i say even those who invented the technology and so on which enabled e-voting are not using it um, that doesn't mean they are not advanced i hope that we will get back to option a4 you know, one of the beauties of option A4, it, it, it takes place in a particular polling unit. So everybody knows everybody. But it's a very small unit. Mm -hmm. They only know what's happening in their unit. And they know the truth of the strength of the various contenders and parties in that unit. So if a particular person polls the highest number of votes, there is no surprise. There will be no crisis. But the people in that unit only know what happened in their unit. They wouldn't know what happened in the hundreds of thousands of units across the country. So they will not even then conclude, oh, our person lost. They will wait, but they have the result of their unit. And their party agents will collect the results, send to their headquarters. The police would have it, the SSS, all the security agencies, and the electoral um, officials at headquarters. They will have it. So there, is no, there are so many layers of verification that there's no way in Abuja some INEC will sit down and change the results. All right. That's the beauty of June 12, 1993. We knew the result. We all knew the result. And when the only way, I suppose, um, the regime of Babangida could have done it was the way they did it, Anali. But they couldn't have gone on, concluded, and announced a different result from that which obtained. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm for option A4. Mm -hmm. There is nothing uncivilized about it. <laughs> what is important is what is the objective of election. That option does throw up genuine, authentic winners of elections. Okay, and what about the election supervisory body? There it would seem that uh, politicians and electoral bodies are always at loggerheads. When you win, it's free and fair, it's fantastic. When you lose, oh, the electoral body is perhaps playing to the script of the government in power or the opposition. Well, uh, th 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 that's, again, in a way, I've uh, responded to that problem. The electoral umpire um, is a facilitator of the process in the first place. Um, and 
it says it has the right to announce results. Nobody can announce it. And it's working within a legal framework, um, which politicians and voters don't necessarily understand. All this would be eliminated if they are just there, facilitators, they provide the logistics and so on, um, and add up the figures which everybody has after an option A4 process, there would be no problem right. of on whose side the electoral empire is. Um, it, it, take the electoral process majorly back to the people, the control of it. Option A4 gives control of that uh, um, process to the people at the polling unit level, um, not at the Abuja level. Well, Ambassador Baba Kingiwe, before we let you go, we might just um, put this across to you. You rightly uh, come be described as a statesman, an elder statesman, and uh, you've been in government, you've been a technocrat, you've served as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, you've had other ministerial portfolios, and uh, at some point in time, you were Secretary to the government of the Federation uh, in the Eredua days. So, is Nigeria an impossible country to administer? Um, no. I think Nigerians are the easiest people to administer. Um, all Nigerians want from their leaders are one communication. They want their leaders to connect with them. They want their leaders to identify with them, with their aspirations, with their struggles, and so on. Um, Nigerian people are patient people. There is no country on earth, I believe, that can survive as we do the kind of challenges that we've been facing over time. We are patient people. We are tolerant people. And we are fair-minded people. We know, you know, what is possible and what's not possible. We know what's right and what's wrong. All we want is for our leaders to adopt the attitude of do as I do, not as I say. If they see that their leaders themselves are suffering, their leaders are also struggling just as they are, and they are facing the same issues, same problems. Um, Nigerians are very, very, very easy to, to administer. In fact, very, very helpful. Um, they can even help the government, <laughs> you know, to better administer the country. Um, once they are carried on board, our people need to be connected with. They need to be communicated to. All right. And they will be on the floor. We are, we are very nice people. Okay. Yeah. Well, sometimes you describe yourself as a retired politician, mm -hmm. and uh, people wonder that is there such a thing? Uh, does anyone in these parts actually retire from politics? They may not be as active as they used to be, but um, mm -hmm. are you really retired from politics? Let's put it no. Um, like, uh, politics is in everybody's blood. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's not. Uh, <laughs> When I say I'm a retired politician, mm. I mean I'm no longer seeking an elective office. All right. Of course, I have my views, my, my, my aspirations, and my wishes for Nigeria and for Nigerians. And um, I cannot just be aloof from the political process, so to speak. Mm. But um, no, I'm not running for any office. Right. I, 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 I operate with other people, you know, to bring about the kind of society that we, we, we wish. Well, with regard to June 12th, mm. what would you say is your greatest satisfaction or, if you like, dissatisfaction with the whole process, the years of, uh, as some would say, various administrations living in denial and the eventual recognition and uh, the conferment of honors on some of those who were key actors. 
um, on the component of honors and so on are just consequential, not um, very um, is appreciated, but not very important. Um, I think my satisfaction is that it was something <laughs> now some of us labored for. We worked to bring about June 12th. It, it required a lot of planning, a lot of strategizing, a lot of hustings and campaigns, which took us to almost every local government in this country. Um, we connected with people, we communicated with people, we saw people's reaction to us. Um, and orchestrating all this and culminating on election day and coming out victorious. Forget about the technicalities of uh, official announcement, but we were victorious. Mm -hmm. That was wonderful. It was a wonderful journey, wonderful experience. Um, and I savor it and cherish it um, all my life. Um, my regret, frankly, is that we were not able to actualize it, um, to go through with it. You see, many people um, didn't know Chief Abiola well. Mm. Um, they, they had some idea of Chief Abiola, um, rich man. Um, yeah, in politics, yeah, and there he was in the NPN and so on. Um, but they didn't know the man, Chief Aviola, and what he stood for. Um, I knew him well. I knew him before he, um, we joined forces in politics, and I knew him, and we worked together um, for the elections and thereafter. But you see, it is Nigeria's loss that we never had a President Abiola in power. He had great passion, great ideas, great vision for this country and for the people. He had aspirations, drawing from his own background of, so to speak, coming from grass to grace. Um, he, he, he I, that I regret. I regret for my country, I regret for my people, that we would not be where we are if he was given the chance to shape the trajectory for Nigeria's future. Um, I regret that. Um, but we move on. Well, just one final take. Yeah. Um, back in 1972, uh, you were Head of Current Affairs yes. and, and uh, Features yeah. in the then Broadcasting Company of Northern Nigeria, BCNN. Yeah. Yeah. So, we described you at the start of this program as a media practitioner. Mm -hmm. yeah. The media, the Nigerian media, and the evolution of democracy. What state, what position has the media been in? They've been an asset to this democracy, or as some people now say, they're beginning to be the vehicles for some <coughs> divisions that we have seen, but assess the Nigerian media and Nigeria's democracy. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Nigerian media of those days, you know, we elder, older people talk about those days, but it's the truth. Um, you know, they were unique. Um, you had both the print and the electronic media. Um, were manned by people who, if they were not in the media, could be somewhere else equally. So the government officials, the entrepreneurs, the media people were all interchangeable. Any one of them could be doing the other's job. Um, and also it was not long after independence, after the Civil War and so on, there was some kind of uh, um, collective consciousness about the national interest and about values and uh, ethics, what's ethical, what's not. Um, 
I think that atmosphere, I, I came into broadcasting from the university. I taught, I was teaching at the university. Hmm. I resigned from teaching and went into broadcasting. Right. Um, and from there, I went into the foreign service. So, as I said, if you take my own trajectory as an example, we were all, one person can do any of those things, and there was no issue. I don't know. We had internal, you know, the expression D notice, like in the UK. Um, government can issue D notice to the media, say this story, there is D notice right. on it. And everybody respects it, and they don't use it at all. Um, but here we don't have formal D notice system, but we had internal discipline right. to issue ourselves the D notice. Nowadays, <laughs> anything goes. Anything goes. I'm sorry, the fear of the media is the beginning of wisdom. But um, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I've gone beyond the stage of pandering to people's egos and so on. The standards are not as they should be. Um, they write beautifully. I love reading columns in newspapers, for example, or watching insightful programs like yours. But generally speaking, the quality of um, the practitioners and the quality of the output could be improved upon, let's put it that way. And I know some publishers who use their publications as a vehicle to blackmail people, um, that either to part with their money or to take certain positions and so on. There is a lot of regulation that needs to be done and the exposure that needs to be made about um, the media and streamline it, make it really respectable so that when the media say something or write something, people can take it to the bank and can say, yes, is the fourth state of the realm, not just because they claim it, but because they are actually the guardians of um, freedom, of democracy, and watchwords, watchdogs over government and holding government to account, which I doubt if I can qualify the press of these days in those terms. Yeah. Well, Ambassador Baba Gadai King, we will look forward to your releasing uh, this re recording of your yeah. recall yeah. of, uh, of, of uh, the whole saga of June 12. But, but if we're not preempting anything, what, what are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at about one and a half hours of recording. If you are, <laughs> you are, your bosses will allow me to use their medium, I'll be very happy to release it. But that's discussion for another time. <laughs> yeah. So, so but you, you wouldn't let us yeah. know when exactly you release it? No, um, anytime feasible. <laughs> yeah. Let's meantime All right. enjoy, savor, and honor the Nigerian people, honor Chief MKO Abiola on this democracy day. Let me just quickly say, um, you see, some people are saying, oh, why change May 29th um, to, to, with June 12th, blah, blah, blah. You see, there was nothing unique about May 29th. It, May 29th was not the first time that a civilian democratic uh, president, a democratically elected president, took over from the military. Right. It wasn't the first time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, President Obasanjo played roles in both the first occasion and the second occasion. The first occasion, he handed over as military president to a democratically elected civilian president, Shehu Shagari. Right. Second time, he took over, <laughs> you know, from um, General Abdul Salami Abubakar as now the elected president um, of Nigeria, there was nothing unique about it. It is not the first time. And we all know what happened, the f elections of 1999 and so on. Nigerians were fed up with the military government. The military themselves um, were eager to disengage, and they hastily arranged an election with a view partly they said to assuage the Southwest, and they just arranged the elections and so on. People did not care so long as they were going to go. 
and it went. So the, the kind of palpable, um, credible, uh, democratic process of the election of June 12th was not present in the elections of uh, 1999. And, you know, the, the, the democratic processes, the process that we had, there was no struggle involved in wresting power from the military in 1999. The military themselves were the ones who said, look, Otiton, we want to go, you know, come. And they arranged it and escaped as quickly as they could. But June 12th was a process w w when the political class was pushing pressure on the military to go. Um, we had the transition program, elections canceled, primaries canceled, and so on, but the pressure was on. So the politicians and the Nigerian people pushed really um, Babangida to a point of even holding the elections. So there was a struggle. Um, so all these combined make June 12th really more relevant to democracy than uh, May 29th. And uh, I hope that will take sentiment out of it. Um, and as I said, learn the lessons of that date and move on. Ambassador Babagana Kingibi, yeah. we'd like to thank you so much for uh, spending your time with us, sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, even though some of it is still under wraps yeah. as we are with the full unraveling yeah of the story from one who was at best an insider and who was well on his way to being the vice president of uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria in 1993. We thank you for coming on this program. Thank you, Cyril, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to celebrate Nigerians and to celebrate uh, the great achievement of June 12th and to celebrate the driver of June 12th, the late chief M.K. Abiola. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's our program today. We thank you for being part of it. Next week, we'll be back. I'm Cyril Stober. Bye for now.